Hoe koud is die wenkie en skraal, en blink in die doflig en kaal, so weit as die Heerse genade, le die velde en sterlig en skade, en hoog in die rande, versprei in die brande, is die graszaad aan roere soos winkende hande. O treerig die weisie op die oostwindse maat, soos die lied van een meisie in haar liefde verlaat. Op elk grashalmse vou, blink het druppel van dou, en vinnig verbleek dit tot rijp in die kou. That's my home language. <laughs> That's my home language. And that poem has a very interesting history. It has a history, the, the writer is Eugene Marais. It has a history in the Boer War. And it speaks of what happened in the Free State. Hoog in die rande, verspreid in die brande. How the English burnt the farms of the Boers. And how lonely it is and how the wind blows, and how he longs for his love. So, you imagine, I love my language. I read the Burger every day, I read the Cape Times every day, and my Afrikaans teacher in 1976 says to me, you have to come to my house, because in 1976 was the first time that there was television in South Africa. Right? The world got it in the 1950s, I think, but we got it in 1976. Because Forster, Favot said, if we have television, we will become godless and there will be a revolution. So in 1976, there was television. And my Afrikaans teacher, Mrs. Sali, actually Mrs. Hisham, she was Sali before, she called me to her home because we lived in a one-room flat that was smaller than this place. My whole family, sometimes we were 20, smaller place than this. And uh, small rooms, no bath, no bathroom, <coughs> no electricity. So we couldn't have a TV. So she had, she called me and I went to her place, nice place, lounge, television. So I sat down and I watched the Afrikaans news, and it was Rian Kreivachen. And he was talking about kids being shot in Soweto. Of course he was saying communist, terrorist inspired, violent, and so on. But of course, you can imagine in my head, and she asked me to come, obviously with, a, with an intention in mind, to see what was happening. And so, at that time, I began a journey which really took root in September 1976. And in September 1976, on the 2nd, I was in Standard 7, which is now Grade 9. Some of you may have heard the story before. Our junior high school had the seniors march to us. And from that day to now, I have been in marches. But what came out that day was black solidarity. Because the children in Mannenberg and in Lange had been shot. And there was anger everywhere. The, the struggle started in August, but it really took off in September 76. And on the 2nd of September, we marched into the city. And you remember what happened to the Philippi High School students uh, that marched into the city here? They got shot at. We got beaten like you can't believe. We got tear gas like you can't believe. And I was black and blue. And my mother was going to the maintenance court to get maintenance from my father who wasn't paying at that time. And she saw me. And the point about that was, by that night and over the few months, I had learnt a new word for myself. I wasn't coloured Cape Malay, 
I was black. And I wasn't black because of the color of my skin. I was black because I politically identified in a unified oppressed people. A unified oppressed people. Particularly a unified working class. And I'll come to working class later when I explain in more detail what I understand by the meaning of Soweto. So I got home and my mother said, what were you marching for? And I said, black power, I'm black. And she started smacking me and beating me and said, you colored and I don't want you to get shot. And the reason they were beating me is because my mom and aunt and even my dad, in the, 1940, no, in the 1950s, they were young and they were working in factories. And my mom and aunt worked in the garment industry their whole lives. You know what the garment industry is? Making clothes. And they were members of the Garment Workers Union in Johannesburg because they, we came from there. And they were shop stewards in that union. And they knew Solly Sachs. I don't know if you heard of him during the week. He was one of the leaders of the Communist Party who built a union which tried to unify white and black workers, but particularly Afrikaans workers with black workers. And my mom and them marched against the first law that was used to destroy the Communist Party called the Suppression of Communism Act which was made to destroy their union. And they, were, were, they marched to defend their general secretary and to defend their union. And then they lived through the 60s and they told me about the past laws and the marches against it and they told me about Sharpeville and they told me about Mandela and they said, you guys can't do this, you're going to go to jail. They're going to shoot you and they're going to kill you. And they beat me on behalf not because they were beating me on behalf of the state, but they were beating me to try and protect me. That is where I started 1976. So I want to take you a little bit back. Just a little bit. I'm going to talk to you about... what I call schools of freedom. Now, I want to ask you some questions. In the world before colonialism, I want you to give me some examples. What, what education do you think young people got, children got? How were children educated? Because I'm sure you heard about property and I'm sure you heard about um, land. But did you hear about the people who actually lived? and how children and youth like you, and young adults like you, how they lived and how they got educated. Who wants to try? Boys and girls, how were they educated? Uh, from what like, uh, I'm told at home, like the grandmothers and the mothers are the teachers. Uh, they would teach you how um, a girl is supposed to do certain things and you as a boy, this is what you have to do, and uh, as the, you grow up, uh, they, you would go with, uh, for example, for boys, uh, they would, you would go with uh, the ones that are hating cattle, and they would teach you how to do things, and the women are actually the ones who are teaching uh, the kids like the way of life, that this is how we do things. And... Who wants to volunteer what girls learned? Yeah, to respect, to, to behave the, 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 the way the woman behaves. How, how, how is a woman you should behave because you're not a man. Yeah, things like that. So you were trained how to be a wife if you were a girl? Because a wife had many duties. To have more children, but also to work the land, to cook, to clean. And the men did what that chap was saying over there, lie under the tree and smoke. Uh, no. Um, and the men were herding cattle, which always is much easier work. Am I right? Yeah. It's easy work compared to women's work. Mm -hmm. You work the land. 
and you see how hard that is. The men's work was easy. But what did the youth learn when they started becoming men? The men, young men. So women learn how to be wives. What did young men learn? How to follow their father's footsteps and how, how to, to, to use sticks, like they, they to fight with sticks, how to, 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 to know their own clans, to, to, to how, to, how does the family tradition have been run. And, and let's say if the father passed, passed away, then he has to carry the tradition of the family, especially to those first boys. Amabuto. Amabuto, yeah. yeah. What's it? Okay, okay, let's turn it over first. Okay, for, okay, I will go in Sunday or I should. Sunday? Yeah. Well, uh, Amabut actually, it, it, it's the warriors. So um, as, as, as a young boy, you would go from herding cattle where they start to train you uh, how to fight. And then you start with stick fighting and then you go to bull killing by hand and then spear and shield. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you see how people were schooled. And then when colonialism came, right? So I'll start a little bit with my own history or, or my family history. Um, I don't believe I'm, I have any land. I don't believe I belong anywhere in the world. This is my home. But I also believe the world is my home. And I'll tell you why now. I'm black, but my ancestors come from Malaysia, Indonesia, India, Germany, and Ireland. That's where my ancestors come from. The Malaysians and Indonesians came here as slaves. Right? They came here as slaves. They were brought by the Dutch East India Company. And then, with them, came, oh, and my African ancestor, which is very important, Mozambican, which is my great-grandmother, was Mozambican slave, brought here. So, under slavery and colonialism here, we must remember this is the city that is the home of our colonization, of our conquest, and of our unity as a country. Children were regarded as property, slave children. Like, like adults were regarded as property. You were taken away from your parents so that no emotional bond could form between you and your parents. And you were sold off to go and work on a farm, largely on farms, or for the government in doing stuff like building or whatever. But mainly farm work and household work to clean homes um, and carpentry and so on. So the question about slavery is, you got whipped as a property, like, if the donkey doesn't want to do something or the ox wasn't want to do something, they whip you. So, the education that was received was how to be a slave, not how to be a human being. White children, very interestingly, didn't go to school. They didn't go to school. Poor white children were the majority. They got educated in the same way as farm worker kids get educated now. Beaten at home, work on the land, and church. And in the church you got preached to. In Sunday, Sunday school you got preached to. You didn't get learned to read and write. So, until the 1920s and 30s, the majority of white people could actually not read and write. Right? But I'll come back to schools now. The critical thing to remember is that schools arose in South Africa for different reasons. And I'll come back to that when I just take a detour elsewhere. We think it was just like that here. But there's a chapter in Karl Marx's book, The Cap Capital which is not difficult to read. It's actually one of his easiest chapters to read in Capital. It's called The Working Day. And it speaks about how workers worked in Europe. 
But do you know how old workers started working? At what age workers started working? I guess. In factories, in mines. Seven. Seven. And how long did they work? Eighteen? Eighteen hours. Sometimes there was a children's commission that showed that children worked 24-hour shift twice in a row. So 48 hours the kid would work, then take a day off, or part of a day off, and then come back to work. Those were the white children. The white? White children in Europe. They were not... They were... They were not the people who colonized us, because the people who made the wealth from them, they led the colonization and later convinced them to colonize us. The struggle to get decent education, quality education, came out of the socialist movement, out of the churches, and from liberals. So trade unions struggle for the right of working class children to be educated. Socialist parties demanded universal education for everyone. Liberals said people ought to be enlightened. And the churches, the liberal churches, supported education because they wanted people to be godly. And the struggle in Europe, in Germany for instance, before the 20th century, in the 1900s, they had universal primary school education and even secondary school education because the socialist movement was strongest there. In England, they got it late in the 1920s or 30s and really in the 1940s when the Labour Party, the Socialist Party came to power. Universal education. So working class children, like most of our children now, only got to school in the 1940s in Europe and North America. In South Africa, I'm going to come, now I want to, I just want to introduce some concepts before I go to South Africa. When, when, when I look at 1976, there are three things I want us to look at. Four actually, but three mainly. There's the objective conditions that led to 1976. There's experience. Sometimes people call it structure and consciousness. But there's objective conditions and there's experience. In the middle is the subjective. Those who lead, those who organize, it doesn't matter what their ideology. But they call the subjective factor or subjective conditions. Experience and objective conditions, whether it's science and technology, whether it's how to build a house, whether it's how to run an economy, what that economy is, and experience of all the people, those combine into knowledge. The most important thing the bourgeois do is they try to limit knowledge of the objective to experience. And our struggle is to combine objective and experience. And today, if you look at it in terms of school, understanding the budget, the education budget, or the budget for water and sanitation, is part of getting knowledge about the objective. Knowing the knowledge of being 41 years old and having to wear a nappy because you're disabled, and not having a toilet. That knowledge and that pain is not enough to change the conditions of toilet. So you have to combine objective and experience into knowledge. Because experience is knowledge and objective conditions are both knowledge. And through that we get to subjective. And subjective can be Helen Ziller and Jacob Zuma on the one hand, it can be Boko Haram, it can be the Israeli state, or it can be equal education, 
cosine 2, EFF, and so on. All right? And that is what is important. That, that's where, when it becomes subjective, it is the world, the world view you bring. It's the world view you bring to objective conditions and experience. It's the world view you bring. So, what were our objective conditions? You've learned all this stuff, hopefully, during the week. You learned about mines. You learned about factories. You learned about farms and bantustans. Very important. And you learned about townships, right? Now, those were objective things. They constituted our economy. They constituted our daily life. Don't forget suburbs with, with townships, ne? but we're, not, we're focusing on black experience. We're not focusing on white privilege at the moment. So let's look at that, and, and particularly black working class experience. There's mines, factories, farms, townships. And then there's an important area called demography. Anyone know that word here? Demography. D-E-M-O-G-R-A-P-H-Y. It's the makeup of a population. Exactly. It's a makeup of a population. The most important thing to remember about 1976 is youth and children. You read about children power in that handout, I hope. Right? Children, and specifically black, African, and colored working class children. That, that's the critical thing to remember about demography. So our objective conditions, and I'm going to come back to demography here. I want to discuss experience in the Bantustans and on the farms of children. The life of black people on farms and which was the majority of the area of South Africa, was to live under whip, largely, in extremely difficult conditions. The life of children was to work on the farms, right? And almost never to get to school. You're lucky if you got to a church school. Colored children here were paid in wine for their family while they worked on the farms, right? So, then the question of Bantustans under apartheid. What happened to children there? They got hungry, they had to work, and if young men did stuff wrong on, on, in, in, in the Bantustans, in the traditional homelands, in the tribal areas, what happened to them? The chiefs got to beat them up, right? So the experience of youth was very, very difficult. And when youth got to school in the Bantustans, it was largely at primary school. Very few high schools. Only black elite went to high schools. Only the black elite went to high schools. And a few, few poor people went to high schools. Mines, the experience of young men on the mines. And then fathers and then children knew what was happening on the mines. And the, there was a white, a black experience on the mine. There wasn't a colored experience on the mine. It was Indian and Chinese as indentured laborers. And one day you'll get to talk about that. But the children of mine workers, fortunately by the time we had mines, children didn't go down the mines. You were over 18 when you go, went down the mines. Factories, mainly white, colored, and later African, right? And the coloreds and Africans did unskilled, unskilled labor largely and slowly moved into, into skilled labor. Now, during apartheid, what started happening is because the majority of people lived on farms and bantustans, they created townships. And in townships, there were primary schools largely. And 
the majority of African t uh, high schools were what do they call them? Agricultural schools. To produce workers for white farms. And in the 1970s, in the 1970s, they changed it because the capitalists said to them, we need decent education. We need skilled workers. In 20, 10, 20, 30 years, black African skilled workers are going to be needed to run the economy. So, they did two things. They lowered, they lowered the standard. African kids had an extra year of school and colored kids had an extra year of school. They lowered the standard, the pass rate, before you had to get 50% to get into high school, when you were in primary school. They lowered it to 40%. And the schools flooded with children because everyone's family, people working in factories, largely, because that's where, what happened in townships, and also on the mines, wanted their kids to be educated to have a better life. So the kids flooded into schools, right? But in the schools, what did we have? I didn't have a maths teacher. Then I got a maths teacher for, for three months, but I knew more maths than the maths teacher, right? He didn't finish uh, matric. He was standard nine. The majority of black African and colored schools had unqualified teachers or the minority of teachers had a degree or even a teacher's training diploma. And that still lives with you today. That still lives in our school today. Because we must remember the majority of teachers over 40, over 40, would have had teachers who didn't know much about subjects. And so that tradition is passed on to the teachers now. But townships were also large, large places where people lived and had a type of experience. Everything from the church choir and funeral society through to soccer clubs, drama, and so on brought people together and it socialized people. The most important thing for us is schools. Young people went into schools. Then a small group, a very small part of white working class kids ever went to university. If you look at the most educated people in South Africa, it's English speaking white people. White Afrikaans people hardly ever went to university. They went straight into the government service, most of them. Only the elite white Afrikaners the people who live in Stellenbosch and Franschhoek, their children went to Stellenbosch University. The priest children went to Potchefstroom. Right? Here, the most educated section of white people was the white English-speaking people. UCT. Um, Wits University. And Rhodes. And there was also the most liberal campuses. And that's where you got NUSAS. Those universities also developed the black consciousness movement. But also, remember there was Fort Hare and University of the North. So a minority of children of teachers, black teachers, black nurses, black policemen, chiefs, managed to get to university. Sorry? When you say they actually want to govern, what type of positions do they have? Everyone, everything from sweeping in the railways to train driver. Um, so uh, the whole, that's, that's like a minority. The, what you have to look at, you have to look at the structure of the whole economy and not just reduce it to the repression. Um, the, the whole economy, the, the whole state apparatus, was everything from the grants office to the police, the army, 
the teaching core. Many, many white teachers were Afrikaans speaking. They went into the schools. But their main thing was ISCO, which is now Arcelo Metal Steel, ESCOM, uh, Transnet, which was South African Railways and Harbours. That is where white working class people went into. And essentially, black people were kept out of those jobs. But slowly, because white people became educated and more wealthy, white working class people, black people moved into the jobs. And also because they found it that in the unskilled jobs, they, could pay, they would pay black people less. So they would pull people into unskilled jobs. Also an important thing to remember is that workers and families and churches worked hard to take the sharpest working class children to universities. The sharpest working class children to universities. And then among Indians and coloreds you had traders. No, not so much among colored, but particularly Indians. You had traders who saved money, small shops, save money and send their children to university. <coughs> so quickly you had the growth of the black consciousness movement coming out of that class of children. Black children who went to universities. They weren't the children of the working class. They were largely lower middle class children who went to university. And some working class children, very small minority. And they formed the black consciousness movement. But for our purposes, the important thing to remember is the South African Students Movement, which is the high school students. And even though it was no bigger than equal education is today, it may even have been smaller. Let me tell you, it didn't have money to organize. It didn't have facilitators. It didn't have staff. It didn't have a building. It was a movement. And you guys are too lazy. You need a movement. You are too lazy, you need a movement. And I'll come to that. Uh, when you say that they actually left high school and worked for government, I thought you meant that they actually entered, you know... Um, public service. Yeah, public service. Yeah. Um, was it... Uh, my question now is, is, is that, was it mainly like white English... Uh, Africans. 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 Since... Uh, be before 48, it was English. So the... English and, and those were the educated elite that dominated the public service. And then the Bruderbund, which was the Afrikaner nationalist, managed to push them out and brought in Afrikaners. And the civil service was, half of it was inefficient, incompetent. The magistrates, the magistrates had no education. The magistrates hardly had any education at all and there were white magistrates. But here's something important to remember. What happened in the Bantustan administrations? They had white heads, but who were the most people in there? Sorry? I can't hear. Black people. Black people were in the Bantustan administrations, and some of them were the most cruel police. The most cruel police. In Qatar, Lenox Sebe, and so on. But by that time, I promise you, if you went to Siskai to get your pensions, you had to search for the file. Because the state bureaucrats there, they were just state bureaucrats, like we have now, state bureaucrats. But the exact same thing happened for in the white bureaucracy. The exact same inefficiency existed in the white bureaucracy. So... We come to Soweto. Afrikaans is the key. It's the spark. The movements of liberation are defeated. The movements of liberation are defeated. There are few ANC people underground and still fewer PAC people underground. And the smartest leaders, people like Murphy Morobe, Tokyo Sekhwale, Dan Mutsitsi, uh, Tandi Modise, Cheryl Carolus, Johnny Isel, 
they come out of the black consciousness movement. The smaller group of ANC people came out of the 1973 strikes prior to 1976, the workers' movement. And they grouped there. And very quickly they linked up. But you all were talking about Chris Haney and them. They pushed for MK to come back into the country. And when kids were shot down, people like Murphy Morobe and Tokyo Sekhwale fled the country. Now I want to come to youth and the importance of remembering what youth did in the township and in the schools. What is the characteristic of young people, especially high school people? What is, a, what is, a, what is your, not me anymore, I, even though I wish I was in a high school. And it can't be in Saudi, it can't be Tutuzo, it can't be, yeah, it can't be any of the older people. It must be the younger people. What's the characteristic of high school learners that you have to deal with as facilitators? Huh? <laughs> um, but m most of them, they have this um, pop star kind of like attitude. <coughs> so, <coughs> pop star attitude? <laughs> Very influential. Very influential. And what do they think they know? Everything, right? <laughs> I think they know everything, right? So, what did we do as 76? There's a brilliant speech which you guys must see. Chotze Sitlolo. He was one of the leaders of uh, 1976. Instead, we stand erect and we claim our manhood and we're taking over from our parents. Our parents have given into the system of apartheid. They've taken the struggle as far as they could. They've lost. And there was no understanding of how people were trying to survive and what had happened to the movement. We just didn't have that. We just mobilized and thought we were the first people to struggle, some of us. And then the first political text I read was we, we had a toilet. The only place you could be private in my house was in the toilet, outside the house, outside the flat. So there was no electricity, and my comrade Azam Muhammad had given me a, a book called The Sun Shall Rise, which was a collection of speeches from the dock of ANC and PAC leaders and Communist Party leaders. And the first thing I read was Nelson Mandela's speech from the dock. You, you all have, have you all seen that People's Law Journal that we had on the Rabonia trial? Okay, if you haven't, just, just let us know, then we'll give you some more. Um, but that, that speech in the dock was the first piece of political thing I read. But like my generation, most of young people, we thought we knew everything. But the things we learnt were songs and solidarity, bullets that were shot at people, funerals, and then I'm speaking about my own experience in Cape Town now. After our march, the next thing we thought, we heard, is there was going to be a strike, a general strike. Now in Soweto, the SSRC, the Soweto Students' Representative Council, which arose out of the movement, formed, called for a rent boycott, because people were paying rents for their houses. They called for a boycott of rents when the rent prices got increased. And they called for consumer boycotts. And eventually they called for a strike. And, and they were talking about they needed the support of their parents who were earning low wages, they wanted to support their parents, and their parents needed to support them. And the strike was successful. In Cape Town, by that time, colored workers were the majority in the factories, and mainly women, in the garment industry, and in the food industry, you know, making, cleaning fish, and the tin industry, and so on, canning industry, and so on. Those were the two main industries where colored workers 90% women worked. Um, and then there were shop workers and stuff like that. A minority of African workers worked on the docks as stevedores, where they, you know, those ships that get loaded that take goods overseas, that's where the majority of African workers work. And also in places like the abattoirs. And 
The division between colored and African people is very big in Cape Town and it still is very big. But 1976 was the watershed of unifying African and colored struggle because every colored clothing factory shut down in, on the 15th and 16th of September 1976. And all the African workers didn't go to work. And you had the first movement of colored workers recognizing that there needed to be a unified trade, un trade union movement. And because I grew up in a family of workers, I always knew that an economy cannot survive without workers. And when you, it was the first time that my parents and I agreed on anything, was when they went on strike. Right? And so the important thing to remember from our generation, 1976 was both a victory and it was a defeat. It was a defeat because most of the leaders of 76 were, either went to jail or went to prison. And some were killed, like Steve Pico in 1977, Elijah Loza, um, Luke Mazwembe, and many other people were, were killed in detention. Um, the question then is, and I'm finishing up on this, is what happened afterwards? In 1978, 79, and 80, we organized young people, the leftover young people here in the, in the Cape. We organized. We went to prison. I went to prison a few times. Other people went to prison for much longer time. But we organized. In 1980, we had a bigger school boycott because there were more schools. The population had grown. And again, TV was a good thing. It carried a message. And again, rock music on television. Say kids want to be pop stars. I remember the Friday afternoon, you know there was a top 10 of music, so I think they still have it. They still play top 10 music, top 20, top 30. Yeah? So I used to listen to the top 10. I didn't listen to the top 20. I thought the top 10 is all I want to know. And the number one hit was Pink Floyd's The wall. the wall. And what's it? What's it say? We don't need no education. We, no need, we don't need no thought control. And it showed kids going through a machine in school and coming out the video on, te on television. The Friday afternoon there were 10,000 kids on school boycott. The Monday there were 100,000 kids on school boycott as a result of that. And everyone was singing that song. Right? Um, so what I want to say to you is the 76th generation, people like Vavi and so on, uh, myself, also help organize workers. And many, the majority of people who weren't leaders in 1976, but were the people who were, who were organizing on the ground and struggling and going to funerals, they went into the factories. They went into the factories and some of them went into the mines. And many of them became shop stewards. And in 1980, a new generation entered the factories. So, 1979, there were 10,000 workers in Fusatu. 10,000 African workers in Fusatu, the Federation of South African Trade Unions, came before Fusatu. In 1985, there were over 250,000, between 250,000 and 500,000 workers when Fusatu was formed. Right? And... The 1980 school boycott across the country gave us the cadres to organize 1985, to organize COSATU, to organize the self-defense units in townships, and more soldiers for MK. But the main struggle was the mass struggle of youth movements. Because once those of us were out of school, we needed a political home, and we formed youth movements. So all you facilitators, get out there and organize youth movements. There are too many youth to organize, too many post-school youth. Organize youth movements in the community, because we won't win a new revolution, which is what we need. A new mass democratic revolution that leads to social and economic change. One that can be peaceful. 
not necessarily will be, but can be. But it's up to you guys to seize the moment, not to sit in workshops the whole time. They are very necessary. I'm not talking about political education. Not think you can do it on your own. I was deeply disappointed at the sleep-ins. Let me tell you why. You did wonderful work, right? But how many other organizations did you go visit, say, come in? Come sleep with us. How many churches did you visit to say we're sleeping in? None. Right? How many creches and how many funeral societies and soccer clubs did you go to? That is what we relied on. Not NGO work, but that sort of movement building. If you guys don't do that, everything you've built is useless. Everything you've built is useless. And we will throw stones and we will burn, but there will be no power behind it. So political education is important. But making everything a process is going to kill you. It's going to kill our movements. You need some radicalism before falling asleep. Okay, that's me.